Good evening and welcome to the third session of the Futures Intersectional Black Women Interrogating Technology Speaker Series. I want to first thank my partners in this event, the AUC Data Science Initiative, the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, and Mozilla. My name is Tamara Pearson and I am the Director of the Center of Excellence for Minority Women in STEM charged with leading this groundbreaking initiative focused on highlighting the unique intersectional lens Black women bring to the development and utilization of technology in our society. I am so excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Moya Bailey. We are so proud to call Dr. Bailey an alumna of Spelman College, where she initially endeavored to become a physician. But while at Spelman, she fell in love with women's studies and activism, ultimately driving her to graduate school in lieu of medicine. As an undergrad, she received national attention for her involvement in the Nelly protest, which she will speak about today. Dr. Bailey is an assistant professor in the Department of Cultures, Societies and Global, Global Studies and the program in Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Northeastern University. Her work focuses on black women's use of digital media to promote social justice as acts of self-affirmation and health promotion. Currently, she is an MLK visiting scholar at MIT. I don't wanna take any more time away from this amazing speaker, but there are a couple of housekeeping items. There's both a chat and Q&A function available for you to use. The chat can be used to dialogue with other participants in the webinar. However, please post any questions for Moya in the Q&A. We plan to leave about 15 minutes for audience questions. And without further ado, I introduce Dr. Moya Bailey. I'm sorry, Moya, we can barely hear you. Uh oh, there you go. Oh, can you hear me better now? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I was just saying it is such a pleasure to be here. I am so grateful to you, Dr. Pearson, and to Dr. Noble for having and inviting me here today. I uh, was recently asked uh, what invitation has been the most exciting to me to accept uh, while I'm doing this promotion for the book. And I had to say that this one definitely was. It's such a pleasure to come back to Spelman and, and be a part of this space. I'm gonna start sharing my screen so that you all can see the slides that I have. So can everybody see and hear me? And can I just get a verbal confirmation? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So as much as this institution of Spelman has caused me grief with its conservative and sometimes puritanical values, there is no place on earth that I have felt more free than within those gates. Spelman was and is a revelation and a crucible that forged me into the person that I am today, subsequently making it possible for me to write the book that I'll be talking about with you. I am joining you all virtually from land that is traditionally stewarded by the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag, and the Pawtucket, also known as Bath Boston, Massachusetts. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I was really moved by a non-land acknowledgement in which indigenous elders made clear that land acknowledgements are not enough and that it can sometimes help white supremacy relax. So I'm not interested in helping white supremacy relax, but when it comes to our turn to the digital in these pandemic times, it can be easy to forget that this hardware that we use to communicate with each other and runs all over Turtle Island, which connects our digital devices, is made from minerals extracted from stolen land and mined by exploited people around the world, which is all to say that there is a long and strong history of pre-colonization and enslavement that we as people connected to Spelman can draw on. When discussing my work 
and its social justice implications. I cannot forget the too often invisibilized logics of settler colonialism that can become even harder for us to acknowledge with our need to turn towards the digital in these COVID times. My talk is titled Massage Noir Transformed or How Nellie Made Me a Digital Alchemist. And it alludes to the story that Dr. Pearson also mentioned that propelled my activism around the unique oppression that Black women face. And if you're interested in uh, tweeting about the talk, uh, this is my social media handle, Moya ZB, and I'd love to know what you think and stay connected that way. So I'll talk a bit about the quote unquote Nelly protest, uh, my coining of the term massage noir, and then writing the book, Massage Noir Transformed Black Women's Digital Resistance. I'll be speaking at length about my research for the book, which is available for pre-order at your favorite independent bookstore. I examined the networks that Black queer and trans women use through the production of digital media with a lens of queer and feminist theory. I show that these networks built through digital media production are significant attempts to redress the lack of care that Black, queer, and trans women receive from healthcare communities and society. I argue that these processes of digital media production produce more than just redefined representations, but networked connections that can be understood as a form of healthcare praxis in themselves. I argue that Black women's online presence an online resistance to misogynoir is a form of activism that should be taken seriously as a health intervention and as a form of digital alchemy. Alchemy is the science of turning regular metals into gold. When I talk about digital alchemy, I'm thinking of the ways that women of color, black women in particular, transform everyday digital media into valuable social justice media magic that recodes failed scripts. I argue that this process of redefinition challenges the normative standards of bodily representation and health presented in popular media. Representational images contribute to negative societal perceptions about Black women, which can precipitate racist gendered violence that harms health and can even result in death. Racism depends on perceptible difference to determine which bodies are expendable. And in this moment of digital black hypervisibility, black women are particularly vulnerable. At the core of my research is the idea about the survival of gender marginalized black people in a country and on land that has traditionally understood the importance of their health through the capitalistic frame of labor. To this end, my work asks, what is the value of black life outside of an ableist capitalist framework that relies on seeing bodies as commodities? And in what venues and in what ways do black people articulate the necessity of their lives beyond mere survival? Although I didn't know it at the time, I started writing this book as an undergraduate at Spelman College. I was on the road to becoming a medical doctor when two things happened that made me shift course. As Dr. Pearson mentioned, I fell in love with women's studies and I got international attention as one of the leaders of a small pushback on campus against the rapper Nelly. Both events profoundly shaped my thinking about the way black women are treated in society and moved me to coin the term misogynoir which in turn led to the book. As a first year student from tiny Fayetteville, Arkansas, I was appalled when Dr. Beverly Garsheftal told the Spelman College entering class of 2005 about Sarah Bartman's experience as a human exhibit in Europe during the early 19th century. Bartman, a young Khoisan woman from what we now recognize as South Africa was displayed throughout Europe to paying white audiences as an example of an animalistic and inferior nature of African women. 
Implicit in Bartman's display was a comparison between her body and that of the white women who viewed her. European scientists equated Bartman's anatomical differences with sexual deviance, drawing conclusions about her sexuality and subsequently the sexuality of black women from her form. Her butt and genitalia were used to justify racist and sexualized violence as well as the continued enslavement of Africans in the world. Dr. Guy Sheftal explained that the exploitative way Bartman's body was treated in life and in death was made possible under the guise of quote unquote objective science through what ba though what Bartman actually endured was objectification through scientific racism and sexism. In my first week at Spelman, before I'd even attended a class, Dr. Guy Sheftal had challenged my thinking by describing the differential treatment Black women experienced on a global stage. And it was after that moment that I knew I wanted to take every yeah, class. Cool. I was awakened to the profundity of the unique nexus of experiences that is Black and woman on this planet and throughout colonial history. Along with enrolling in Dr. Guy Sheftal's classes, I took classes with fellow feminist professor, Dr. M. Bahati Kaumba, Dr. K, as we affectionately called her, who gave me the final nudge into the open arms of the comparative women's studies major. As I was matriculating, I also got involved in the feminist political organizing on campus, all of which were supported by the Women's Research and Resource Center, the home of comparative women's studies, the home of the comparative women's studies department. It was actually Dr. K who asked, you're taking all the classes, why not be a major? And when she put it that way, there was really no room for rebuttal. But in truth, I was already a willing convert despite having every intention of attending medical school, but that was not to be. As a 19 year old junior and then president of the Feminist Majority Leadership Alliance, also known as FMLA, I showed the group Nellie's music video, the song Tip Trill, which had started to air on late night television, on the late night television show, Uncut on BET. The video featured most memorably a scene where Nellie slides a credit card down the crack of a black woman's butt. Our group decided to name him our misogynist of the month, not knowing that Spelman Student Government Association had agreed to partner with Nellie and his foundation, Just Us for Jackie, to hold a bone marrow registration drive on our campus in an effort to save the life of his sister who had leukemia. And now I'm going to play for you uh, a scene from our student produced documentary that talks about student activism on campus. And this particular scene is about the Nelly protest. So uh, this again was created by myself and two other students in Dr. Ayoka Chinzera's Digital Moving Image Salon. We were the second uh, group of students to be in the class. So these are my early uh, digital media making skills. So please forgive the quality. <laughs> and also, um, yeah, they're just a little, some jump cuts, but uh, please, please enjoy. In a way, it was bad for, I guess, the response that I've gotten, like, oh, you go to Spelman, you know, what's your opinion on tip drill? And it was kind of negative connotation with it, but it was just like, it, it set a platform for me to actually speak about, well, you know, what do you actually think about women in music videos? Some of the students, I want to say 30% were outraged. 60% still go to the club and shake their ass to the song. While 10% secretly want to dance to the song, but they don't. I don't listen to Nelly anymore. I really don't. I really don't. I have no respect for him. <laughs> In Dr. Garcheftal's uh, feminist theory class, we had a discussion about um, how to like resolve the whole Nelly issue or address the whole Nelly issue, I guess, um, with whether or not 
he should come and we should protest or if the whole thing should just be canceled and he should um, be uninvited. And I um, was one of the students who volunteered to be active in, um, in starting the protest and organizing it. I made, I made flyers with, um, we had a meeting where we came up with some like slogans, some like catchy lines, uh, found some of his lyrics and made flyers and I put them, or we put them like everywhere. I spent, I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and some of them, the lyrics were a little provocative. So I had to um, <laughs> copy the little like, what's it, the Spellman, the Spellman stamp um, to approve it. The flyers were advertising for a meeting that we were gonna have we were gonna show the video and have a discussion. But by the time the meeting came, Nelly had already pulled out of the blood drive, canceled it. Well, his people decided that he wasn't gonna come once they heard that students were planning to protest. So in the spirit of letting people know about what went down and how the drive got canceled, we decided to still go ahead and have some kind of action on that Friday. So we had the video playing, we had signs, you know, we care about your sister, why don't you care about ours? And the press was there, it, it blew up. And so the thing was that Nellie's people had gone to the press and made it look and appear as though Spellman had canceled the drive when in fact they were the ones who pulled out. So when the press was looking at the situation, they were like, why are these Spellman girls so upset? And you know, they called us angry black women in one article on MSNBC. There was just a lot of hostility and we got a lot of, there was a lot of backlash on campus and off that was just really, really negative. So the FMLA raised these questions about the massage and wire in his video, although we didn't have that language yet. And when we heard Nelly was invited to campus, it seemed only fair that we ask him about the way he represented black women since he was asking us for our help. Nelly declined our offer to talk about his music. Instead, he went to the press, twisting the story such that it seemed that Spellman canceled the bone marrow registration drive because of the video, an assertion that many still believe today, though Spellman orchestrated its own drive. The story garnered national and eventually international headlines, both praising and condemning Spellman students for daring to talk back to the music. It was a hard lesson in the hypervisibility and invisibility of being a Black woman. And it was also my first experience with death threats uh, as a young college student. So it, it was also a really hard time to be uh, trying to address this issue and then also receiving such backlash both on campus and off. Nelly felt entitled to our assistance with saving his sister's life, but, not, but did not feel that he had to address us, the Black women who dealt with the fallout of his video and lyrics in our day-to-day -day lives. As young Black women, we felt the impact of the video and lyrics in the form of street harassment in the United States and abroad. We dealt with assumptions about our sexual availability to men in the form of unsolicited commentary on our bodies, on our clothing, and on our time. He used his celebrity built on the bodies of black women to urge people to support an underappreciated cause, the health of black women. Black women are far less likely to find a match when it comes to a bone marrow donor than their white woman counterparts, partially because of Black people's deep distrust of the systemic racism in medicine, which, which makes them less likely to volunteer to donate. What was not quite clear to me in 2004 was the irony of using a fame garnered through limiting representations of Black women while refusing to address that decision and also wanting support from those very same Black women. I wasn't quite able to connect the dots between popular media representations of Black women 
and my and other Black women's experiences with discriminatory housing practices, intimate partner violence, street harassment, employment discrimination, and ill treatment from healthcare providers. But my interest in the role media plays in shaping the perceptions of Black women became all consuming, such that the goal of becoming a medical doctor morphed into getting a doctorate to investigate the role that media representations play in the treatment of Black women patients by white doctors. I learned about the ways historical popular culture seeped into the consciousness of supposedly objective future physicians, which prompted me to consider how popular cultural representations influence Black women's treatment in society and medicine today. It was in writing that dissertation. In a way, it was that. It was in writing that dissertation that I landed on the word misogynoir to describe the particular venom directed at Black women through negative representations in media. How do you describe the ways that Black women are uniquely denigrated because of their gender and race? I played with a couple of terms before landing on misogynoir. Initially, the term existed only in my dissertation and when I was invited to join the Crown Feminist Collective, an online blogging community of feminists of color, the word made its debut. From 2008 to 2013, the Crown Feminist Collective dominated the think piece blogosphere with insightful and pithy commentary on popular culture, primarily through the lens of hip hop feminism. At its height, the CFC blog was home to 14 black and feminist of color bloggers who wrote about the news of the day, paying special attention to highlight the intersection of race and gender in their writing. Founded by black feminist scholars, Brittany Cooper and Susanna Morris, the graduate students at Emory University in Atlanta, the CFC bridged a seemingly contradictory love for crunk hip hop music that dominated the radio airwaves in the aughts and the feminist theory they were learning in grad school. The blog was a space for timely and incisive criticism. My first post, They Aren't Talking About Me, discussed my concern about how my own apathetic response to misogynoir and music, it was the first use of the word outside of my dissertation. Once I used it, other members of the collective used it more and it appeared on more posts. From there, some members of the blogosphere began to use it, but no one more compellingly than womanist blogger Trudy at her now sunsetted gradient layer. Her work introduced online communities to the word and she deftly articulated its utility. Her work and others helped the term read, reach a wide range of audiences, including an international one. When I coined the term, I did not expect it to go viral. In addition to appearing in the New York Times, Ebony Essence, and I was just recently told that it was on an episode of Charmed, it has also been referenced a number, a number of times in scholarly journal articles and monographs. The adoption of the term and its wide reach in digital spaces make further theorization of its use important for gender critical race and cultural studies audiences outside the academy. And I'm really hoping that this book uh, helps to do that and make that critical connection. Misogynoir describes the anti-Black and racist misogyny that Black women experience, particularly in the US and through visual and digital culture. Misogynoir is not simply the racism that Black women encounter, nor is it the misogyny Black women negotiate. Misogynoir describes the uniquely co-constitutive, racialized and sexist violence that befalls Black women as a result of their simultaneous and interlocking oppression at the intersection of racial and gender marginalization. The term is a portmanteau of misogyny, the hatred of women, noir, the French word for black, which also carries a specific meaning in film and other media. 
French film critic Nino Frank coined the term film noir in 1946 to describe the gritty, cynical, and initially American movies that have unusually cruel themes for the time. The motion picture genre is characterized by its dark and sometimes sexually charged undercurrents. Examples include films like The Maltese Falcon and Sunset Boulevard. Like film noir, misogyny noir originally described American media, but similarly grew to transcend borders to describe an unfortunately global phenomenon. Whether in film, television, or as I examine extensively in the book, digital media, misogyny noir has found a home in each of the communication advances of the last two centuries. Misogyny noir is perpetuated through popular media like cartoons, menstrual shows, yearbooks, and even our current social media. Black feminist theory clearly articulates the power of the image to serve the hegemony of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy by controlling the way society views marginalized groups and how we view ourselves. Black feminist theorist Bell Hooks discusses the importance of producing images that counter the normalizing force of stereotypes, but also exposes the danger of reactionary positive images that can constrain and confine. We need images that break that good, bad, white, black dichotomy. As Hooks argues in her book, Black Looks, we should be asking ourselves questions about what type of images subvert, pose critical alternatives, and transform our worldviews and move us away from dualistic thinking about good and bad. And I would say that that's really the crux of the book, is looking at who and what are the images that Black women are creating for themselves that do that work that doesn't exist in that dichotomy? Uh, what are Black women creating for ourselves that challenges that good and bad uh, expectation of what is being produced, but creating the things that actually excite them and creating the media that is meaningful to them? The media that circulate misogynoir help maintain white supremacy by offering tacit approval of the disparate treatment that Black women negotiate in society. Whether the Jezebel, Mammy, Sapphire, and later the welfare queen, or even the strong Black woman archetype, misogynoiristic portrayals of Black women shape their livelihoods and health. And as media studies scholars attest, negative images and narratives do more than affect the self-esteem of the populations depicted. Misogynoiristic caricatures materially impact the lives of Black women by justifying poor treatment throughout all areas of society and throughout history. So my book is really asking us to consider what happens when we bring different elements of scholarly research together so I come from a queer and trans cultural studies perspective, along with uh, digital humanities training. And then I have my own interest in Black feminist health science studies, which is another field of study, I would say that's emergent, that I see as being really integra integrally connected to, to my research. And it was bringing those three things together that made it possible for me to write Misogynoir Transformed. In the book, I argue that Black women's digital resistance is a form of self-preservation that disrupts the onslaught of problematic images society perpetuates through the creation of new content and practices. While memes circulate through social media platforms that depict Black women, as more ugly, deficient, and hypersexual than their white or non-Black women of color counterparts, Black women employ these same social media platforms in ways that subvert negative stereotypes through processes that can be their own health-affirming praxis. Simply put, both the process of creation and the materials created are co-constitutive harm reduction strategies. 
I conceptualize the alternate representations created by Black women as both counterpublic productions that trouble stereotypical depictions and as vehicles for processes that allow for other types of health interventions. I use multiple case studies to illustrate the ways in which redefining representations empowers media creators to tell another story about their lives, one that is sometimes in reaction to mainstream narratives that distort their realities, but also visionary for the kind of realities they wish existed. So I'm gonna talk specifically about chapter two, which is where I get into um, the work of Janet Mock. And so uh, one thing that you might have heard of Janet and Janet is somebody who has really transcended uh, where she started on digital media and social media spaces. So I'm gonna have us kind of imagine and go back to Janet Mock as a web editor for Marie Claire Magazine, somebody who wanted to tell a story and was using the platform she had available to her to tell it. Self-described trans advocate, Janet Mock was moved to become a more outspoken trans activist because of the murders and suicides of queer and trans youth. In the early 2010s, she used her platform as a former web editor for Marie Claire, as well as digital tools like videos and hashtags to reach out to other trans women. Trans women embraced the tag and used it to discuss everything from their desire to transition and the violence of being outed in unsafe situations, as well as the banality of everyday living and dreams of job success. Transitioning video blogs, uploaded to YouTube, provided recommendations for specific trans-friendly doctors, and depicted bodily changes, all identified with the hashtag girls like us. Where the medical community had been slow to acknowledge the growing demand for transgender services, trans women are using their own network to get what they need and find the providers who are receptive. To assess who was using the hashtag, I called more than 11,000 tweets from a 10% sample of Twitter activity. I utilized the visualization software Gephi, a platform that visually renders the connections between data points to chart the network of people using girls like us. Because Gephi generates nodes that correlate with the number of interactions between Twitter users and their proximity to one another, I was able to determine the primary users of the hashtag and their level of interconnection. Not surprisingly, Janet Mock and actress Laverne Cox were the primary users of the hashtag. Rather than invoking the cis women as, rather than invoking cis women as the reference point for their discussions, the Girls Like Us network focused on trans women and placed trans women's experiences at the center of their conversation. Girls Like Us signals a conversation that is for, by, and about trans women, not their proximity to another group of relative power. Girls Like Us exemplifies the magic of digital alchemy through this practice of shifting from the margin to center, utilizing established mediums to create literally transformative realities. Other Black trans activists like Tourmaline are using the internet not to appeal to mainstream media about their humanity, but to support and push for community for themselves that promotes their own well being and survival. The added benefit of creating this community online is that it is visible to those outside of the network and does the work of humanizing inadvertently without draining energy from the more important task of supporting each other. Digital media is creating and supporting a network of connection among communities that have traditionally had trouble finding each other, let alone reaching a larger audience. By doing this work of community online, groups are leveraging both visibility and education at once. Trans women of color are telling their own stories, but in the process, 
are forcing more recognition for their identities in mainstream publics. So I was really interested in the health and well-being that was discussed using the hashtag girls like us. Not surprisingly, these tweets offered a complex and multivalent representation regarding trans women's relation to health and well-being. Health was used to raise awareness about the physical and mental health concerns within the community, but also a way to talk about negative media portrayals. Trans women have more trouble navigating the world when negative tropes circulate about them, making multiple types of discrimination much more of a reality. When Fox News used a photo of Robin Williams dressed in drag as his character, Mrs. Doubtfire, to illustrate a story about trans healthcare, one can begin to understand the life and death stakes of trans misrepresentation. Janet Mock tweeted, guess who used Mrs. Doubtfire to illustrate a story of trans healthcare? Hashtag girls like us. The tweet links to an article by Take Part Press that reports on the photo and its subsequent impact, citing Mock in the process. Mock is quoted as saying, trans people are not wearing a costume. Our lives and struggles are not jokes and using such an image spreads damaging stereotypes that who we are is put on, entertainment and fictional. It's those same misconceptions and stereotypes that allow trans people to be discriminated against when it comes to accessing housing, employment, and healthcare. Mock's words indicate the importance of images in the real world and what those health outcomes mean for trans women. In the same 2011 National LGBTQ Task Force study of Black, trans, and gender nonconforming people, 41% of Black respondents said that they had experienced homelessness at some point in their lives, more than five times the rate of the general US population. Fox News reduced trans women's lives to a fictional movie character who dons a wig and padding to be able to interact with his children. Robin Williams' drag is portrayed as funny because the audience knows he's a man. The gag relies on the trope that a man in a dress is ridiculous and therefore comical. Society's willingness to connect men in drag to trans women impacts the way trans women are able to move through the world. It makes their real issues a source of comedy and their lives something to be made fun of and not taken seriously. When such images are used to illustrate a story of trans healthcare, trans women's lives are made ridiculous by association and their health made trivial. When trans women go out in public, they are at risk of life ending violence. When trans women seek medical care, they are at risk of negative encounters with medical professionals because of the bias engendered by the trope of the man in a dress. The use of a picture of Williams as Miss Doubtfire results in the legitimacy of trans health concerns being called into question. If transness is only drag, then why would gender affirmation surgery be medically necessary? While it's not clear how many people saw this article on Fox News, the Fox News channel has maintained the highest watch rate of all basic cable channels from 2013 to the present a sobering statistic that gives this a much more difficult, or that gives this type of dangerously misleading and transphobic content another way of understanding it. So in closing, media representations influence how different marginalized groups are perceived in society. This coupled with the medical establishment's deeply embedded beliefs about the marginalized body has meant a history of slow progress in ameliorating healthcare disparities. When we think about cultural competence or cultural proficiency, cultural brokerage that is used in healthcare settings to try and offset some of the racially insensitive 
experiences that people have within healthcare, it becomes important to think about social and societal representations of Black women. The realities of Black queer and trans women's health can be particularly stark. I'm thinking about conscious decisions to opt out of care in which uh, sociologist Ruha Benjamin, also Spellman class of 01, calls informed refusals, moments where marginalized patients make choices to follow their own thinking rather than that of healthcare providers. If Black queer and trans women do make it to the doctor, their fears of discrimination are often validated. In a 2004 study, Researchers identified nine ways that providers contributed to disparities in care. And one of those ways included relying on stereotypes about racial groups, particularly when pressed for time. In addition to biomedical health concerns, black, queer, and trans women negotiate a unique threat to life as those multiply marginalized by gender, race, and sexuality compounded by the disproportionate amounts of violence that their communities face. The life expectancy for trans women is just 34 years. Black trans women are seven times more likely to come to this violent end than their white trans sisters. The murders of black trans women are a serious sociocultural health problem, one that deserves the attention and resources of biomedical intervention and requires a rethinking of networks of communities as well as networks of healthcare. The murders of black trans women do not elicit the same outcry within our communities as the deaths of black people at the hands of the state. There is a question about whether all black matters, all black lives matter and to whom. And so I see Janet Mock's work with the hashtag girls like us and my work with regard to it as a project that moves us to the ways that Black lives and Black embodiment matter within and outside the networks in which they circulate. Black feminist scholars have revealed a connection between images and impact in the lives of Black women, but the act of transference, the steps from stereotype to structural oppression remain obscured. As Bell Hooks offers in Black Looks, I really want us to continue to ask this question about how do we move, from, move away from dualistic thinking. So Misogynoir Transformed lays the groundwork for my next book project, Misogynoir in Medicine, where I look more specifically at the ways Black women are treated in clinical settings as both physicians and patients. And I believe, as the Kambahi River Collective states, that if Black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. So similarly, if Black women as a whole were healthy, it would mean that many of the barriers to quality health care would necessarily be removed creating a more ethical and just health culture for everyone. Black women have mobilized via Twitter hashtags to challenge their representation in US visual culture, carving out precious space for incubating restorative practices and projects digitally. While these efforts do not presume to disrupt the dominant ideology in mainstream culture that shrouds Black women, they do provide maroon landing sites of respite. Black women are making room for themselves in digital media that exceeds what was ever intended by social media platform creators. Using media to negotiate misogynoir is not a long-term strategy for addressing all that needs to change in society, but the way Black women have enacted digital alchemy certainly creates opportunities for transformation. I just want to say thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Moya. That was 
Amazing. I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to start with the ones that came from the audience. So the first question is, describe what you believe are some of the unintended consequences of media's impact on Black women's economic and cultural adaptation of whiteness via the Weave Revolution? So I definitely think that there's something about uh, what gets to be expected uh, in terms of how Black women comport themselves or are able to move through professional spaces that signals an ideal type of Black woman's hairstyle. And so we've seen this in the military, we've seen this in uh, professional settings that natural hair uh, becomes something that Black women have to fight for uh, and there's something even so, um, so insidious about it that it's warranted a lot of political movement uh, through these uh, uh, moves to create crown acts in different cities. So the crown acts are expressed political uh, policies that make sure that people do not have to have their hair in a particular style to be able to do the job that they do. And so the Crown Act, uh, I know this is something that's happening in Michigan and other states where people, black women are advocating for their hair to be um, however it is that they would like it to be. But these representations of what black women should be if they are to be considered professional, definitely impact how Black women are able to move if they don't have hair that fits this one particular ideal or norm. So along that same line, do you, do you think when you talk about this, this movement towards you know, Black women being able to, to wear their hair in whatever way they are comfortable with, do you see social media being utilized in that movement in effective ways? Absolutely. Uh, part of the work of the Crown Act has been largely digital campaigns that include photographs of Black women with all different kinds of hairstyles. And you'll also see that a lot of the uh, language that is used to discriminate against Black women's hairstyles uh, uses photographs to show what is and what isn't acceptable. So by providing different images and representations of Black women's hair, it's giving us the opportunity to be more flexible. Uh, I'm seeing in the chat, chat a proud Crown Act supporter in Connecticut. Fantastic. The next question is, um, I wonder in what ways medical schools are address addressing the issues of equity in training programs in medical schools to address healthcare for trans and queer patients? That is a great question. So that's uh, really where my work is right now. I have been speaking to different medical schools. Just uh, last month, I spoke at uh, Penn State's medical school about these issues, talking with medical students about the work they can do to pressure their um, administrations to integrate uh, trans and queer curriculum into what they're already learning. And one of the challenges that medical schools face is that there's so much to learn in such a little bit of time. So what medical students find is perhaps there will be some additional optional um, extracurricular uh, things that they can attend that address these issues, but it isn't being integrated within the classes that count or within the uh, curriculum that they know that they are responsible for. So um, Harriet Washington, uh, uh, one of the writers of the really important book, Medical Apartheid, uh, gives the suggestion that for doctors to address uh, racism in healthcare, there should be some real consequences for doctors who refuse to do that work. 
So thinking about um, uh, perhaps finding doctors who are proven to have anti-racist or to have racist um, actions towards their patients. And I think similarly, we might wanna look at what might be the consequences for doctors who are not providing trans and queer inclusive care? How do we then uh, create a situation where doctors understand that this won't be tolerated anymore? And um, that could mean some real consequences within the practice of medicine so that this is understood uh, and taken seriously. Absolutely. Um, so moving from social media to television media, the next question is, how do you feel mega reality shows slash prototypes like The Real Housewives of Atlanta, Love and Hip Hop, Basketball Wives, et cetera, reinforce or disrupt ideas of Black women's representation and the new trend of Black women and plastic surgery in particular, but enhancements? Yes. Well, I mean, it's so interesting when I think about Real Housewives as a franchise, because my general thought, and has it's always been my thought, like, yes, obviously, these are real people who exist in the world, but why is this the only representation or the only kinds of real life that we get to see in popular culture? And for me, it's less about... Um, whether those shows exist, but the fact that they exist um, to the exclusion of all other representations. When those become the dominant ways that Black women are represented in popular culture, then it really uh, shifts our understanding. I just saw an article recently talking about, you know, again, the crisis of uh, unmarried Black women. And uh, one of the people interviewed answer to that was, to say there isn't actually a crisis of unmarried Black women. Black women are marrying each other. Actually, Black lesbians are a very high demographic of, of married Black women. So it also depends on where you look and how you frame things. And these are not the people that we see in popular culture. These are not the stories that are generally centered when we think about stories of real Black women. And so also in the book, one of the things I'm trying to address is this idea that Black women as a Black women trademark, you know, Black women, capital B, capital W, um, only means straight, only means cis, uh, that there are lots of different ways that people are connecting to their Blackness and that we should be really attentive to that, um, that Black women is not a monolith. And one of the beauties of coming and going to Spelman College was that that was so clearly evident in every class and every uh, aspect of attending that institution. Beautiful. So along that same line, how do we, how do we leverage social media for that to, to round out the view and the, the portrait of black women? You mentioned in your, in your talk um, that there's often a single narrative, especially over this past year when it comes to Black Lives Matter, right? A single narrative really focused on Black men in particular um, and that, that needs to be expanded. How can we play a part in that expansion? I do see the way that we're using social media as one avenue for changing some of the representations people have access to. So in the book, I talk specifically about hashtag campaigns like hashtag girls like us, but then I also talk about queer web shows like um, uh, some of the Atlanta ones between women uh, being one of them as expanding who gets centered and who we talk about, who we imagine, um, and that there's a real power in the media we create for ourselves. So for us, by us pre presents lots of possibilities. But of course, it's not a panacea. Not all of it is feminist. A lot of it can be critiqued. But again, I think having an access to a plethora of images gives us more possibilities for our radical imaginations that can help us go further than uh, what traditional television might limit us to. 
So I'm thinking also about the fact that um, some of our activists, even within the Black Lives Matter movement, have made um, these deals with major networks. So, um, you know, in the talk I talked about Janet Mock, who has a deal with Netflix, uh, Patrice Cullors, one of the BM BLM founders, has a, a partnership with Warner Brothers, and I think Tarana Burke was just announced has a partnership with CBS. So there's a way that people are moving into more traditional uh, media spaces, which is definitely, I think, something to consider. Uh, but at the same time, I think we need to hold on to our spaces that are uh, a bit more free in that we can create different things when we are not beholden to a corporate entity. And there are limits to what, it, what is possible on social media, especially with the proprietary nature of some of these sites like Twitter and um, Instagram, Facebook, the way they're locking down on what it is that people can do. So what I hear you saying is, is kind of channeling Audre Lorde, right? The master's tools will, ne will never dismantle the master's house. <laughs> Exactly. I'm all for us creating what we need. So what's the new social media platform that we're going to create for ourselves? And maybe, maybe Tim Nitt has some ideas about what that can look like. <laughs> Absolutely. So we only have a couple more minutes. So I, I guess the last question I would want to ask you is, what are the conversations that we should be having that you feel like we're not having specifically within the Black community? One is that there's still a real digital divide. You know, I think there's an assumption that we can do everything from smartphones and we can't, uh, that there is still a real, uh, there's something to be said about people who have access to high-speed internet uh, in their home. And we've seen that, of course, during these pandemic times, what that means in terms of students who are getting left behind because they don't have that access. So for me, I think one of our first conversations is still one of who is even at the table and how do we do the work to make sure that we are being inclusive and also that we center people who are the most marginalized when we're imagining what's next for us, whether that be along the axes of, you know, sexuality, gender, or um, where people are located. I just think it's uh, important for us to consider how people are able to, to move in the world. And as Black folks, definitely making sure that we're taking the time to support uh, the most vulnerable amongst us. Thank you so much, Moya. This has been an, an amazing discussion. Um, and thank you for, you know, I think oftentimes even in conversations um, about Black women, we only center the voices of, you know, cis Black women. And so thank you for constantly reminding us that not just do all Black lives matter, but in particular, all Black women's lives matter as well. So I really appreciate you being here today. You are a wonderful representation of Spelman College. Um, oh, and thank you also for the Spelman shout outs. Hi, Tyranny. Hi, Tyranny. <laughs> yeah, you've got some fans from, I guess, from <laughs> here in the audience. Um, so I want to thank everybody for attending this third session of um, The Future is Intersectional with Dr. Moya Bailey. I encourage you. I know I'm going to pre-order Moya's book as soon as we end this call. Um, I encourage you to pre-order it as well. And I hope to see you at the next session. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.